Good afternoon. How are you today? Well, it's uh, 60 degrees and a little windy, which is why my hair is <laughs> bouncing around. And the uh, sun is out, so it's pretty good. Uh, today is uh, uh, my anniversary. Holly and I have uh, survived 20 years. <laughs> We're going to try to do another 20. And uh, we celebrate it in the same month that on March 26, a year ago, she had her operation for a double lung transplant, so that's why I say we got another lease on life together. Not without its challenges, but uh, the alternative was to be very serious challenges and much more immediate, so we deal with things as they are. In terms of uh, politics, uh, McCarthy's an interesting character to watch. Uh, he's also a despicable person to watch. So let's choose the thing that he's in the news about today. Uh, my observation about McCarthy is, uh, how dumb is my speaker, how high is the sky? Now, I have, since the beginning of the January 6th investigation, thought that everything they had should be disclosed to the public. I mean everything. And there's a question now about security. But let's roll this back a little bit. When... The Capitol was invaded by the insurrectionists. Don't we think that they tried to study the security setup then? And shouldn't we have changed that for that very reason? And or added additional kind of security means by which we could protect the members of Congress and their staff and support staff and the security officials. So I, I discount to a large extent that the big problem with transferring the 40,000 hours of surveillance tapes and recorded interviews and so forth, I discount that as being very serious. But there are ways to take precautions so that it's not a problem. So I think all America should have everything because we pay for it. And it all played out in public. And the statements people made, we should have access to it. We should know who the good guys and the bad guys and good gals and the bad gals are. Because we're not getting straight answers from the government. We get leaks. You know, did you know that this was happened or this was said or this is in the tapes? That's not a, that's not it enough. Now, McCarthy has said he's going to let everybody have the tapes that he gave exclusively to uh, Fox. Well, he should have done it at the same time, and he didn't. And why didn't he? He's trying to give an advantage to Fox to appear to say from on high, more authoritatively than others who don't have all the tapes, that this or that is true in the tapes and then to play excerpts of them. This is a political game that can't be countenanced given that the underlying offense was an effort to install a person as president who lost the election and to overtake our government. So uh, that's the way I look at it. And the language of McCarthy is, he says, well, we give exclusives for, for other things. This is not exclusives for other things. What is he talking about? Leaks? Is he talking about an interview that a person has a right to give about a book they wrote? There are all sorts of things that they could be writing or talking about. But this notion of exclusives is ridiculous. Sorry, school bus has some nerve going through our walk and talk, don't you think? So uh, that's number one on my hit parade. Uh, and he'll be on it again and again and again because it's not about governing. It's not about doing what is needed for America. And the author, as speaker of this policy is a person who is quite comfortable with the votes to attack our process that made Biden the president and was not supported by any fact of fraud or misconduct in the election or any law that permitted that. And yet he, as a leader of the Republicans in the House, the House conference played that role. Outrageous. Now let's turn to another group. How about the Supreme Court? 
consisting of judges who are hacks, who are finally paying their due for the jobs that they got. And you know who they are. And the only questionable one among them is Roberts. Which way is he going to go? Well, the argument at hand before the Supreme Court, and there are a number of them coming up, but this one we'll talk about are the student loans. Uh, I had a student loan myself. I did pay it off. I, you know, I've joked that if they were going to forgive student loans, would they forgive retroactively the one I paid? But uh, I'm kidding because for me, the escape from the Bronx in the sense that I crafted it in my mind and, and objective was that if I was going to uh, have any effect for myself and for others, I needed as much education as I could get. Now, my mom and dad didn't go past high school. My younger brother didn't either. People in the neighborhood didn't. And it's funny that one day at high school, <laughs> people were talking about where they were going to go to college. And I, I really didn't have any idea what they were talking about, none. And But I did have a wastebasket next to where I studied every day at home. And yes, I was a grind. I just, I liked studying. And uh, it had pennants on the, on the basket. And so when they talked about schools they were going to, I assumed that those names on that basket were colleges. And I'd say, well, I'm thinking of going here or there. And then people would correct me. And that's how I learned about college. I didn't learn about it from the neighborhood, the church. In fact, when I was in high school, the Jesuits, I think, believed it was better you have no college at all rather than you go to a non-Catholic college and be exposed to the demons of that irreligious fraction of our society. So, and I was very lucky, a friend of mine from the swimming team, whom I liked a great, deal, a great deal, he went to Columbia from the high school, and he became, in a way, a model for me, just as he had been on our swimming team. Uh, John Roy was his name. He's a good friend, and he visited me, and what I, looking back on it was his final days, and it makes me think he was having this odyssey. So, and I, I strongly believed that if you were interested in your community and yourself, the more you could develop your talents, the better you could help others and yourself. So I'm very strongly in favor of the student loans, and I think the rules have been changed several times to the disadvantage of those who have those loans. And the argument before the Supreme Court was, what about the person who would take a loan for uh, a lawn service? Isn't that person being cheated as compared to a person who got a student loan? And the person who got the lawn service loan, loan they were suggesting, both by choosing it, they were choosing a kind of a class argument, which is unfair, but anyhow, that's what they were doing, and in their hypothetical. And uh, there's an answer to that, and it's not a complicated one. The government does choose to prefer actions and conduct that are in the interest of the community at large. So having an education, if you can make something of it and therefore become a person in a society who has a contribution to make without that education that you would not have, that's, that's worth making loans. Are some people not studying or make, taking advantage of school. Yes, I suppose so. I knew them. Uh, but I saw many more in the programs I was in who were interested in learning, and they thought it would help them, and they, and they enjoyed it. They were interested in it. So we got Supreme Court judges, all with advanced educations, judging whether or not somebody should get a loan for a lawn service and have it forgiven as compared to a loan for education. Now, one of the reasons cited for the funds for these school loans is COVID. And there have been programs 
to help businesses during the pandemic. And there are all sorts of small business programs around the country. But the Supreme Court would find those arguments inconvenient during an oral argument with a counsel. I I haven't listened to the argument, perhaps not quick enough to think of the comparative ways that people are helped with loans other than those having to do with college. So, uh, and one of the final arguments is they say, Congress should decide this. Well, you know, Congress did decide this in 2003 and created the power for this program to be executed just the way Biden did it. So what can we say? Can we say, and I don't think we can because they haven't admitted it, but it's strong in the Republican Party that a person with an education might become more liberal than a person who didn't have an education. That's that's just reprehensible. You know, I think of the Buckley family when I was young, conservatives, very strong positions, high education, Yale. So, <laughs> you know, not everybody who has an intellect has a heart. And, uh, you know, whether it's Florida, the two wastrels down there, or McCarthy with a name like that, he must know family that have had to deal with things. These people are only interested in power, and I don't know what they do with it. They just they just crush and suppress and, I guess, collect favors and funds and exposure. And I, They're a menace. They don't belong. Okay, now, turning to another happy song, how about Double Murder? I don't see how they convict the lawyer accused of killing his wife and his child. I, he just, it just doesn't seem to make sense. And one of the reasons it doesn't make sense is because the motive we're supposed to believe has to do with distracting people <laughs> from the problems at his office in which he was basically stealing money and trying to repay it, all of which he's admitted to. I, I'm not sure any of that should have been in the case because I've never heard of such a thing as a motive. And of a man with the rationale he has, I'm not saying he couldn't have a cause, but that one doesn't make sense to me. If I were in the jury, it wouldn't make sense to me, I think. And, you know, they talk about how he had the means because at one time he had the guns that have not been retrieved by the government. So you have to believe he hid them. Well, where? Did anybody search? Did they find them? They, they don't evaporate. These things usually turn up. But whether or not they usually turn up, if they didn't, what if you have? You know, the the classic situation in a murder case is, where's the corpus delecti, the actual person who was killed? Well, we have that. But then the other elements are not in focus. For example, the guns are not in focus. The, uh, the time he's supposedly present, although his timeline changed when he made his admissions. So I, jury, and, the, and the prosecutor's style is all over the place. So it's always dangerous to predict an outcome of a trial you haven't sat through and gauged and watched the jury react. But the most significant thing to me is how members of the jury provided Kleenex to the alleged double murder defendant and uh, because he was crying. So that would be a dangerous sign to me as a prosecutor that I had perhaps made this case complicated. And if he is convicted, I think this other evidence, which was only to show he had bad character and doesn't advance the proof of the murder, could cause a reversal. So isn't that wonderful? <laughs> the, uh, you give a guy a case and he just doesn't know what to do with it. Kiss is the rule. Keep it simple, stupid, and I don't think that they have. I like to finish up with a, a friendly story. Um, Jim Webb was Navy Secretary, and he had an admirable career uh, in the military. And he goes back to Vietnam. He speaks Vietnamese, and he went back with a group and uh, to understand what the war was about, where the fighting was, and so forth. And while he was there, a person 
who lived there came up to him and said he had a dog tag for a corporal, lieutenant corporal, I believe, uh, Larry Hughes. And so this is 60 years after Larry did service there, and he's since deceased, but his family still hasn't had closure. And what, what Jim did was he collected it. They gave the, the person who was kind enough to give them the dog tag $20. And uh, when they came back, Jim went and located the family. And then they had a little ceremony in which, in a metaphorical way, Larry was not left behind. His dog tag was returned to his family. They had this celebration and they put it in a frame that his son can see every day. So that's what I have today. The contrast between people who serve and those who basically F up everything they touch. So uh, I hope you have a, a wonderful day. It's great here. And uh, so I speak to you from my <laughs> cathedral of trees and I tell you, keep hope alive. We're going to beat the bastards yet. Bye-bye.